powerful speaker. Our final panel today is looking towards AI and emerging technologies and will be jointly moderated by Ms. Caitlin Fennessy and Ms. Brenda Long. This panel session will discuss the continued expansion of artificial intelligence systems for an analysis of what DPAs must consider in order to evaluate fair outcomes, along with data protection requirements impacting AI and other emerging technologies. Shortly, we will hear from Ms. Fennessy and Ms. Long. Hello. Thank you to those of you who uh, are joining us right after lunch. We will, uh, we will shortly be doing a song and dance to keep you all awake and uh, entertained. Um, no, but uh, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm truly honored uh, to have the opportunity uh, with my co-moderator, uh, Brenda, uh, to be here today. And a big thanks from all of us uh, to Commissioner White and his team uh, for the opportunity. Um, so let me begin with a, a few introductions of this uh, distinguished panel. So uh, to my left uh, is uh, Dr. Abraha, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights, working on the project I Manage, Rethinking Employment Law for a World of Algorithmic Management. He researches the impact of AI and algorithmic management on privacy and data protection. And as I move across, you will see that we have a, a diverse panel in terms of the uh, types of organizations from which uh, each of them hail. And so we, we are looking forward to a, a multitude of perspectives here. Um, and to his left, let me introduce uh, Mr. Chi. Chang, who serves as general counsel at OpenAI, where he leads the team that manages legal issues arising from developing and offering large uh, machine learning models. Uh, these are, of course, no stranger to any of us, GPT, Dolly, and ChatGPT, which sparked the imaginations of so many and, and really put AI governance on our agenda. Um, prior to his time there, uh, he served as the head of the legal teams for AWS's artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and marketplace businesses. Um, and let me introduce uh, Ms. Brenda Leong, uh, my co-moderator, who will introduce the other panelists. Brenda is a partner um, at uh, Luminos, a boutique law firm uniquely founded by a partnership between lawyers and data scientists dedicated entirely to developing policies and practices around AI governance. Uh, prior to uh, joining this uh, very unique law firm, Br uh, Brenda was senior counsel and director uh, of AI and ethics at the Future of Privacy Forum. Uh, and I also love that uh, Brenda herself has had a diverse uh, career with a long tenure in the US Air Force. Brenda, I'll turn to you. Thanks so much. Um, let me echo the thanks to Commissioner White and our hosts here in Bermuda. It's been lovely so far. Um, hopefully I get to enjoy a little more of it other than just the view through the window as the days and the week progress. But thank you all for, for coming to this very, very obscure topic of AI that you know, hasn't really gotten a lot of attention, but we'll try to, we'll try to you know, clue you in on what's going on. Um, with that. So I'd like to finish the introductions of our distinguished panel today. Um, Philippe Dufresne was appointed the Privacy, Privacy Commissioner of Canada on June 27, 2022, and he is a leading legal expert on human rights, administrative and constitutional law, and previously served as the law clerk and parliamentary counsel of the House of Commons. Prior to his appointment as the law clerk there in 2015, he was the Canadian Human Rights Commission Senior General Counsel and responsible for legal services, litigation, investigations, mediations, employment equity, and access to information and privacy. He has also been a part-time professor at the University of Ottawa 
um, and the Queen's University. Um, and then our final participant today is um, Guido Scorza, a member of the board of the Guarantor for the Protection of Personal Data. He's an Italian attorney and founding partner of the ELEX law firm. Uh, he has also been a legal advisor to the Minister for Innovation and its deputy representative, is deputy representative of the Italian government at the GAC, the Government Advisory Board of ICANN, as well as a member of the policy subgroup of the Ad Hoc Committee on the Regulation of Artificial Intelligence of the Council of Europe. And he is also an adjunct professor at the uh, University of Bologna and the University of Roma Tre. Um, and then I'd like to wrap up by introducing my co-moderator, uh, Caitlin Fennessy is the Vice President and Chief Knowledge Officer at the International Association of Privacy Profes Professionals, where she guides the strategic development of IAPP research, publications, communications, programming, and external affairs. She serves as an inaugural member of the UK International Data Transfers Expert Council on the German Marshall Global Task Force to promote trusted sharing of data and on the Future of Privacy Forum's Advisory Board. Prior to joining IAPP, IAPP, Caitlin was the Privacy Shield Director at the U.S. International Trade Administration, where she worked on international privacy and cross-border data flow privacy issues. She is also an adjunct professor at the international, of international privacy law uh, at the University of Maine School of Law and the University of New Hampshire School of Law. So uh, as you can see, I think we have a, a really distinguished group of folks here with a lot of knowledge and experience in privacy as well as some very unique perspectives on the emerging challenges around AI. Uh, we're gonna sort of trade back and forth in terms of rounds of questions and hopefully get through a lot of really good material for you today. So turn it back over to Caitlin. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we, we heard uh, a bit earlier today about some of the the higher level harms and, and policy issues surrounding AI and particularly where they intersect with privacy. And so I think today, or for, for this panel, we're gonna focus a bit more uh, on the issues beyond privacy. So I wanted to kick off with a question uh, to everyone here. Uh, privacy aside, uh, I would love to hear from each of you what you see as the most pressing risk from AI and what do you see as your organization's uh, contribution to it? And uh, I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative to, to share my quick thoughts on that question uh, first and then uh, turn it over to Dr. Abraha. Um, from the IAPP's perspective, uh, the biggest risk that we see right now is that as policymakers around the world coalesce on shared principles and guardrails for AI governance that they are often largely leaving out one critical piece. And from our perspective, that missing uh, uh, piece in the policy conversations is who is going to do the work. When these laws come online, will there be a knowledgeable AI governance workforce uh, to implement them? Uh, with, with the skill sets needed to do so that go far beyond privacy. And I was, I was really uh, cheered earlier today when we heard from Commissioner Slaughter that what she sees as one of the important, most important pieces is remembering the people. And, and that is what we see as uh, the solution uh, to this challenge. Uh, we learned a lot uh, in the, the privacy field, I think, uh, where policymakers really did focus from the outset in the GDPR and elsewhere on the people, on putting uh, accountability mechanisms and professionals in place, empowering them, resourcing them, making sure they have the right reporting structures to uh, do this work. And so uh, at IAPP, that is something we are very focused on. Uh, at the start of this year, uh, the IAPP, as you may have seen, launched uh, the AI Governance Center. We put in place 20 uh, thought leaders in uh, the field uh, to help guide our efforts to do everything for the AI governance field that we have done for 20 years in privacy. And I can actually report that Brenda uh, sits on that board, as does uh, a representative from OpenAI. We have industry, governments, uh, civil society, and academic leaders uh, represented. And so we have been 
building uh, the research and the opportunities to gather. We have our first AI governance uh, event in Boston in just a couple weeks. And then importantly, the training and certification to build this knowledgeable workforce. And from our perspective, we don't have the 20 years that we had with privacy to build up tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of professionals to turn uh, policies into practice. We have to move at a pace uh, that aligns with the pace of AI, and that is really quickly. So uh, that is my answer to the question. I would love uh, to hear yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful event, and uh, thank you to our hosts and all the organizations. Um, so privacy aside, some of the key uh, or pressing risks of AI, I just want to highlight a couple of them. Uh, one, in my uh, point of view, one is the rush to automate everything and anything without proper consultation, without proper debate and public oversight. And part of that question is we have uh, uh, the current debate on policy and regulatory issues focus on how do we mitigate the risks of AI. Uh, but the, what is missing or less discussed is the discussion that what do we want to automate in the first place? What should be automated and what should not be uh, automated? What part of our life or the decision making, special uh, uh, high stake uh, decisions, which decisions should be uh, made only by humans, not by machines? And part of that question is I think we have to uh, step back and ask these basic questions. And part of that question is who decides what should be automated? which means whose values are embedded in this decision-making processes and shaping our uh, automation process. So the rush to automate everything without proper oversight, especially for uh, critical uh, decision-making systems, is one of the risks. Uh, the second one is the question that are the AI systems actually work the way they claim they work? Um, some of the research uh, show that there are many AI systems used for high-stake decision-making making uh, processes, and they don't do what they claim they would do. They, have, they are prone to errors and inaccurate uh, decision-making. So to give you one example, um, in 2021, uh, journalists at the MIT Technology Review tested uh, two of the uh, uh, commonly used AI systems for hiring. And what they did was uh, to complete that test, they first set up the software, and they uh, upload uh, their um, the, the fake job posting, and they create an ideal candidate for that, um, uh, for that post. And the candidate interview, uh, completed the interview and scored uh, high for English competency. And to try it again, the automated interview uh, uh, asks the same question, the AI system asks the same question, but the candidate answered all the questions in German, not in English. And then the, the candidate received a high score for English competency, even though she was not speaking English. So this shows that they, um, it is not fit for purpose. It doesn't do what the AI system claims doing. So this is a simple example, but there are uh, 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 high-stake decision-making systems that actually do not work, and some of the biggest scandals we have seen are because of this kind of uh, systems. Just to add one uh, point, uh, uh, another concern is the, the concentration of uh, economic power and political power in the hands of few technology companies. And it's not only they own the, the technology, but also they shape the, the policy and the regu regulatory processes and discourse around this um, technology. So what these companies are doing is whatever they, they uh, automate, they break down um, larger tasks, complex tasks into micro tasks, and they outsource to low-skill workers, primarily 
in the global south. And these workers have no protection at all. And this exacerbates the, the economic inequality and the precarity of uh, jobs. Thank you so much. I, I really uh, appreciate you highlighting kind of each of those uh, elements in, in turn, and particularly the, the last one, which I think often is missed in policy discussions. Uh, Chi, can I turn to you for your thoughts? Yeah, sure. And thanks again for everyone for coming and listening to us. I, I hear this is the last panel of the day, so hopefully we'll make it entertaining before everyone goes in and gets a drink. So I think the probably the biggest risk that I worry about is uh, relates to job displacement and, and reskilling. So if you think about, and this kind of goes to the risks and benefits that we always talk about for AI, right? A, the AI systems today can make you a lot more productive in your work. Like there's an MIT study that said, found that ChatGPT can make white collar knowledge workers up to 40% more productive. Uh, and that comes with a trade off as well, right? Because if you're 40% more productive, then what, what happens to that extra time? Who, you know, how is the next generation of people going to learn how to do that profession? And we're seeing this starting in the legal profession even. There are law firms today that are looking at how to use AI in their workflows. And it's generally a very useful thing, I think. Right? It's, it's helping junior associates with tasks that are very mundane and, and, and involve a lot of drudgery. And it can automate a lot of things like helping you know, summarize documents or creating closing checklists or things like that that aren't really a huge value add. But they, they're worrying about what, what is, how, do we, how are we going to train the next generation of legal leaders if we don't need as large of a pipeline of, of associates. And so that entire model is going to have to be rethought. And that applies not just to the legal industry, but to any industry that can benefit from AI. Right? We've opened AI ourselves. We've done studies that you know, we think that maybe there's, there's a potential that 80% of jobs could be could have some sort of, uh, could be improved by AI, and which means it will have some impact on productivity, which means it will have some impact on, on labor markets there. And that's not something that industry can solve ourselves. It's something that we think about very hard. It's, it's not something that government can solve by itself either. So it's gonna take a very organized, you know, uh, work, collaborative discussion and coalition of government and industry and academia and civil society to tackle those, those challenges. Thank you very much, and I think we'll, we'll also go a bit deeper uh, as we go along on some of the, the kind of unique risks that AI uh, presents, not only to those displaced, but uh, to those <coughs> using it. Uh, and Commissioner. Thank you so much, and thank you to the Bermuda authorities, Commissioner White and his team, to the INAI as the GPA Secretariat. What a, what a great conference, and uh, thank you to the IAPP for this panel, it's really a privilege and an honor to be here. I was, uh, in preparing for this, I was looking at the materials in the schedule and I saw the great um, motto for the uh, DPA of Bermuda, Commissioner White's office, and I don't know if you noticed the motto that's, uh, that's there, uh, which is quo data ferunt. And I studied Latin for a few years uh, when I was younger. And uh, so I inquired into that, and it's, uh, it, it is uh, whither uh, data will take us, so wherever data takes us. And that's a play on the motto of Bermuda, which isn't featured on the, when we see the coat of arms, but normally it's, it's written under the coat of arms, and that is quo fata ferunt, and that's from book five of Virgil's uh, Aeneid, and it is uh, wherever the fates will take us, Whatever will be, every future, every fortune, misfortune can be overcome by perseverance. And so it, uh, it connotes the ability to respond to changing weather, fate, and fortune, and with dogged perseverance in any circumstance. So I think it's very appropriate. And I also learned that the insurance industry is, is one of the, if not the biggest industry in Bermuda, which is very interesting because that too, that industry certainly must uh, respond and guard against uh, fate and, uh, and the outcomes. But it's also very relevant, this motto, I thought, to our reflection on dealing with the fast changing and fast evolving technologies in our world, including AI and generative AI. So, um, and, I, and it's also a reminder that with, with that effort and working together, we can, face, uh, we can face these challenges. And so to the question, what are the harms that I, that I see uh, aside from privacy? Well, first, I, I, um, 
I find that it's difficult to completely separate privacy from AI when we're discussing of it, even if we're looking at purely at, at, at risks. Um, there's a recent OECD report uh, prepared for the 2023rd Japanese G7 presidency and the G7 digital and tech working group ministers that um, did a survey of the G7 countries and they listed uh, as the top uh, concerns for AI, according to the G7 ministers, threats to privacy was one of the top three risks in that list alongside uh, disinformation, manipulation, uh, intellectual property rights infringement, and also in fourth place, um, exacerbating bias and discrimination. So, so those are risks. I would certainly uh, take that point that these are, uh, with privacy, other types of risk that we have to be mindful of. And certainly, both on a professional level and a personal level, uh, I am very uh, attuned uh, uh, to the risk of disinformation and manipulation. I was the top lawyer for our, our legislative branch in Canada, so threats to democracy uh, and, and making sure that citizens have information that they need, that they can trust it, that they can trust what they read online, what they get in terms of video and image, certainly something we need to think of. And, and also, as was mentioned, I have a, a long background and career as a human rights leader and litigator, so certainly the issue of bias, exacerbating bias, existing bias, existing power imbalances is something that we need to think about, especially about uh, particularly vulnerable groups such as children. So those things certainly top of mind, but also overall, and that's linked to both exacerbation of, of bias and uh, uh, disinformation or risks about that or bad uses, is the notion of a potential erosion of trust in, in society generally and in citizens generally that they can become fearful of um, Gen AI itself, but also just generally the information that they get uh, online and they start questioning things. So I think that is something that is something to be to be mindful of in the short term and in the medium term. And in terms of what my organization uh, is doing about this, what I am doing as a DPA, I, th I think we, we all should be doing is thinking of how can we communicate to, to our citizens um, the protections that exist, uh, the institutions that exist, because that brings uh, that brings reassurance and that dispels some of the myth. And we've heard some of those discussions this morning about the fact that it is not a law-free zone. And that's why my G7 colleagues and I issued a, a statement uh, last June uh, highlighting that as one of the key messages. The current laws apply, whether it's data privacy laws, uh, whether it's human rights law, whether it's competition. So there is a regime, there are institutions, and I think we can do more um, in trying to explain that. Because it's one thing to explain it to a specialized audience like this one, but how do we explain that to citizens generally? And so the promotion work, I think, will become um, very, very important uh, in that space. Um, when we have um, policies uh, of government that are dealing with uh, AI harms, just to bring this message to highlight. Well, these are, we're putting in new procedures, perhaps voluntary codes of practice, perhaps new legislation to deal with harms in a more proactive way, but reminding that there are some norms that exist, there are some solid institutions that are there to uh, provide remedy and recourse, and also showing that those institutions work well together and they, they work in collaboration, because we see that these are fields where it's not only in the, the, the pure privacy side or the pure human rights side, so there's a lot of a need for this cross-regulatory collaboration. We've created some a forum in Canada where uh, we're, we're ex exchanging more directly with competition, um, broadcasting, privacy regulators will we'll be potentially adding more. So I think that that is, is an important role to, to continue to play as, as, as all of us. Uh, I've made some of my investigations in this field uh, public. That's one of the reasons so that citizens can see, okay, there are processes and uh, they provide uh, protection, whether a complaint is, is, is upheld or not, but there is a process. It's not all on citizens to, uh, to, to address this. So um, those are some of the things that, uh, that we're doing. I will be in front of my uh, parliament um, the Thursday of this week to give uh, my recommendations on the proposed modernization of Canadian uh, private sector privacy law, which has a component to deal with uh, AI and the potential bias and other types of harms, and also 
uh, pushing very much for uh, significant uh, algorithmic transparency. I think if we want to ensure that citizens understand what's going on, uh, transparency is a key part of that. And how do we do that in a way that's uh, user friendly and, uh, and responsive? So I, I will stop there. But the, these are some of the things that we're doing to, uh, to address this issue. Thank you. I, I love, in particular, your reference to dogged perseverance to describe privacy professionals. I, I can't think of a, a better term, but amidst that, you so rightfully point out that this, this really is a whole new uh, landscape that goes far beyond privacy, that, that uh, despite the dogged perseverance and, and, and impressive skills of privacy professionals, we have a lot to learn. Commissioner Scorza, let me turn to you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you uh, to Alexander for organizing this, uh, this, uh, this event. Uh, that's a, a very challenging panel because we are, and we know, the uh, last obstacle uh, between uh, our audience and uh, beautiful uh, Bermuda. Then uh, we will try uh, to do the only things that uh, I think uh, people uh, uh, like, to, to finish uh, in a very, very short time. Uh, let me be very, very uh, honest. I will use uh, some notes. Uh, because I'm an Italian lawyer, then I risk uh, to speak for uh, two hours. Uh, I think that uh, uh, yeah, the most pressing risk, uh, uh, honestly speaking, is that uh, we didn't uh, identify uh, the most pressing risk, and probably uh, we. Uh, uh, aren't able yet to mm. identify the most uh, pressing risk, simply because, in my opinion, artificial intelligence uh, is the most uh, uh, pervasive uh, and uh, the, the most disruptive uh, technology that uh, we, uh, we, we, we know for us, then uh, we hadn't the time. I think that we, uh, we, we need to be honest. We hadn't the time uh, to uh, reflect about the the impact of artificial intelligence on our society. Uh, we need uh, more time, but we haven't, because of course, as always in the past with uh, the uh, technology uh, innovation, technology uh, uh, progress, uh, innovation doesn't wait to be studied, to be studied doesn't wait to be examined. Uh, we, we can say uh, innovation doesn't wait, and I imagine we will speak uh, about that uh, uh, to be regulated. Uh, then, in my opinion, I think that uh, as data protection authorities, uh, we need to invest more and more time and energy uh, in uh, uh, trying to, uh, to, to study the, uh, the, the phenomenon and uh, in uh, educating uh, people at the life with uh, artificial intelligence. Because at the end, we can discuss today, tomorrow, and after tomorrow, but uh, that's the future. Uh, that await for us. We will live with artificial intelligence. Uh, in particular, I think that we need uh, to explain people the risk of using artificial uh, intelligence in an incorrect uh, way. Uh, and uh, uh, also to explain to people the risk uh, uh, to, uh, that, that uh, we face uh, when uh, we use personal data to train uh, algorithm or when uh, algorithm take decision or support simply uh, humans uh, to take, to take uh, decision. I speak only about the risk, uh, not because uh, I can I can't uh, see uh, many, many opportunities around artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, but simply because I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, informing people about uh, uh, the huge, the extraordinary uh, opportunities about artificial intelligence is something for the market and for the business. And I'm sure that companies, uh, they will be able uh, to inform people about the opportunities in the best way possible. Then, in my opinion, we need to rebalance uh, the uh, information and to speak also about uh, the risk. To be very, very clear, uh, I'm not worried at all about artificial intelligence, but I literally be terrified uh, by artificial intelligence in the hands of billions of people uh, that uh, doesn't know the uh, powerful, the power of the uh, artificial uh, intelligence. And I think uh, that it's uh, a matter of fact that today we are investing more in uh, um, uh, training algorithms to know humans 
than in educating humans to train algorithms. And that's, in my opinion, the major uh, problem than, uh, that that's, uh, that's we have. And uh, here, uh, uh, I, I think that we, we need, uh, as data protection authorities, uh, uh, to avoid the major risk. And the risk that I can see uh, is uh, uh, that the market become an enormous laboratory to test, to experiment uh, artificial intelligence, and that then people, users, become lab rats uh, in these enormous uh, laboratories. I think that companies have the duty to test, to examine, uh, to experiment, uh, to evaluate the impact of any artificial intelligence solution on society before to launch a new service, uh, before to open a new platform, uh, before uh, to invite billions of people of using a new uh, tool of artificial intelligence. In uh, this uh, uh, very particular race, in my opinion, uh, uh, doesn't win uh, who runs faster. Uh, uh, win, will win uh, the first who will be able to find uh, a solution uh, to do business with artificial intelligence, uh, respecting uh, fundamental rights, starting uh, from privacy and probably um, using artificial intelligence to increase uh, uh, human rights, uh, fundamental rights, and, and privacy. That's the challenge that I can see. Not the first, but the one who will find the best solution uh, to do business while preserving privacy and others' uh, human rights. Well, well, thank you. And I, I really particularly liked how you kicked that off with, with the sentiment that, you know, we, we haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen it all. And, and reminding us all to approach this with an open mind and, and approach the way we govern it with that awareness that there's still a lot uh, left to come. Brenda, let me give you the last word on this one. Uh, I will try to keep it somewhat brief. Um, I, have, uh, I have five children. Two of them are millennials and three of them are Gen Z. And so I use them as my own little extremely randomized focus group when I need to do research for, for things like this. And um, in, in interacting and talking with them as they are all major users of technology and platforms and services and, and now you know AI, um, whether they know it or not, um, uh, I was sort of asking them what they thought about this. And I think the variety of the answers I got and then when I combine that with my interactions with people as, as a partner in my firm when I'm talking with people at, at client organizations, companies, corporations who are using AI, is just the complete diversity of understanding or lack of understanding about AI, what it is and what it can do. And this, this goes so far in both directions, both the overestimating and the underestimating of where it exists, how it operates, and what the impact is. And I feel like I spend you know, a tremendous part of my time just trying to sort of equalize that level of understanding the playing field. Um, I know many of the people in this room are lawyers. As a lawyer, one of the foundational things of any conversation or discussion or law is to set the definitions of the terms that you're going to be using so that you're all operating from sort of a common baseline. Um, and of course, in interpreting the laws that are going to be passed and the regulations we're going to have, assigning scope and, and depth and breadth to certain terms and to what technology is covered and how. Um, and right now, there is just so much variety. And I see trying to reach some kind of commonality of understanding, some kind of consistency of boundaries and standards, even before we decide what metrics to use or how to measure those, um, is really one of those threshold questions that we're, that we're really facing now. As, as Caitlin pointed out, we have had decades, literally, to sort of face these challenges in the privacy sector, as, again, the people in this room are very well aware. And it feels like we have about five minutes right now to address this for AI and figure out what are the, what are the boundaries, what are the ground rules, what are the, um, you know, areas in which we're going to, to operate um, to try to control these technologies across every possible industry in our world and, and in our society. There's a um, trend on the newer platform threads right now 
um, where everybody is sending, posting a thread saying, dear algorithm, please send me people who, and then listing a list of characteristics that is their common hobbies, interests, preferences, whatever it may be. Um, and I mean, literally, you can't go on threads right now without seeing these, uh, these variety of posts. And these are just from all people of all types. These are not technology people or lawyers or uh, anything particularly uh, affiliated with AI. And so I think it's just really interesting to see that perspective of what people think AI is and how they think they can influence or how they expect it to interact with them. And then how we can sort of explain, hopefully explain to them and to regulators and to their staffs and to the other people that have the power to, to say these laws, uh, what, that, what that is, what that can be, and how we should really put comprehensive controls uh, around that. So, ready for the next question? Okay, so um, now that we've heard privacy aside, what are uh, some of the concerns? We'll, we'll flip it back, it's a privacy event. Um, and um, <coughs> we know that privacy officers are increasingly being called on to understand the risks of these systems and to find the ways to address them. So, um, particularly for uh, Dr. Braha and uh, Chi, um, if you were somehow miraculously given access to a room full of people who were involved in privacy regulation and, and that were to be available to you, what would you tell them from your individual perspectives is what you think about the best way that DPAs could identify and address the risks around new AI, new AI applications? Well, maybe I'll start. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, this is a great question. Um, I mean, there are uh, different ways to identify risks. Uh, I know it's not easy, but I just want to highlight uh, two steps that DPS should, uh, DP, uh, DPS should do and a couple of uh, common excuses that they may get from the AI industry or from the companies. So the first one they have to do is they have to identify the the AI systems they, they use in their respective jurisdictions, especially for uh, high-stack decision making. So this is a kind of mapping exercise. For example, what are the AI systems that have more than 1,000 users in your jurisdiction? What are the AI hiring tools used in Bermuda, for example? What kind of decisions they do and what type of data do they process? So this is a kind of mapping exercise so they have uh, a picture. The second step is straightforward. They have to exercise their regulatory functions and auditing functions. They have to request the, the, the companies and ask to demonstrate that they comply with the applicable law. It is not the responsibility of the DPA, it's the responsibility of the companies to identify the risks and demonstrate that they, they comply with existing laws and they have a mitigating strategy uh, um, in place. So once they uh, been uh, exercising this, uh, especially for example in the GDPR, it's, uh, it's required by law that companies who identify high risk and if they cannot mitigate it, they have to consult the DPA. And DPS now, they have to evaluate that how often they have been consulted by, by uh, companies who run AI uh, systems. And while exercising this regulatory function, they may encounter some of the common excuses from companies. One of the excuses is that AI is different. This is not entirely true, it's a lie. AI is uh, it's not completely different. It has its own unique uh, aspects, but this is not an excuse not to comply with uh, existing regulatory systems. It's, AI is not exempt from data protection, for example, as long as it involves processing personal data. And as we know, most AI systems function by scrapping a massive amount of uh, personal data. So in fact, data protection law is the, the, the fundamental part of AI regulation. Data protection is AI regulation, so we should have uh, proper data protection uh, in place, and they have to demonstrate this. 
Uh, the second excuse is that AI is black box, <laughs> that they cannot understand how it works, and it's difficult for the company to demonstrate uh, compliance. I think DPS should also reject this kind of claims. At least they have to challenge, because uh, black box AI is a design choice, and this design choice serves the interest of the company. If a company decides to use an AI system for a specific purpose, it has to make sure it complies with existing uh, rules. So it's complicated and uh, OPEC should not be an excuse. If it truly cannot be understood, they should not be used in the first place to make high risk decision uh, processes. The last one is the last common uh, excuse is that the company may say the AI system they use is developed and controlled by a third party vendor. This is particularly common in the employment context where employers use monitoring and surveillance systems deployed and uh, controlled by uh, third party vendors. And this should also be rejected. If this, a, a company decided to use a specific AI system for a specific purpose, they have to take a responsibility no matter who developed it. Thank you so much. I, I, uh, one of the founding partners of my firm is a data scientist, and I think if he had been in this room when you said the words black box is a design choice, he would have literally stood up and cheered because he gets so tired of that being used as a, as a sort of get out of jail free card. And, and as a data scientist, he's like, it doesn't have to be that way, or it doesn't have to be that way in the way that people mean it or, or try to use it at least. So thank you for that. Um, Chi. Yeah, I, th I think the most useful thing here is is collaborative and frank and productive engagement on both sides. So in speaking with a lot of different policymakers about AI, a common theme that, theme that I hear is reflected on, on what you guys have been saying, which is most government officials don't actually want to deal with the regulation during the hype cycle. They would rather wait and see how things shake out, but they feel like they can't do that. They can't stop and wait because either they're, they're concerned that the technology is progressing too quickly or they're hearing from their constituents that you know, they're afraid or they're not sure what's going on. And so you see that theme across a lot of areas. And then on the flip side, from an industry perspective, uh, you know, we don't think we should be the ones deciding kind of democratic values of AI systems and how they should be input and how, how they should be run, to your, to your point. Like it, it shouldn't be an industry-only thing. It should be something that we are all trying to figure out together. And so OpenAI has done a lot of things in this area. So for example, we, you know, we've made a lot, we've called for regulation, like the way, the way we engage with regulators and policymakers is I think a little bit different than traditional technology companies. We've also, you know, we've created uh, industry groups to try to kind of convey our concerns around AI safety and other, other risks. And then, you know, so I've, every conversation that we've had with, with government, I find the most productive ones are the ones where both sides understand that, hey, we're trying to work towards a common goal here, which is useful, you know, beneficial AI systems that help people, uh, trying to figure out jointly how to mitigate those risks. What are those risks and how to mitigate them? Right? If you look at the technolog technological progression over the last year in AI, like things are moving extremely quickly. Right? Next year systems, I'm guessing, will make ChatGPT seem extremely right, like very, very uh, old and antiquated, and the ones after that will be even more advanced, and so on. And so that's moving very quickly. I think so. So this this model of kind of open, transparent, um, educated dialogue and engagement, I think, is the most useful way for for regulators and industry to, to interact. We definitely see that from a lot of the firms that we work with as clients, that they're coming to us with the, the sort of good faith of, we understand these systems have risk, we use them, we're people, they affect us and our families and our society as well, and you know, how do we work forward on this collaboratively? How do we work, work productively to reach either best practices or regulatory outcomes uh, or whatever? Thank you. So I, I want to take those comments and, and now uh, turn to our regulators. Uh, effectively, four reactions there. I saw some <laughs> nods of uh, agreement uh, in some respects while, while each of you were speaking, uh, in, in some respects saying things that are a, a bit opposed. One, um, 
that regulators don't necessarily want to regulate during the hype cycle, but also kind of seeing nods of agreement that the privacy issues really are at the core of uh, regulating AI governance. And I, I know that both of your offices have launched investigations. Commissioner Scores, I want to turn to you first. Yours was the most uh, public. Uh, what unique enforcement challenges do you see related to AI governance? And, and feel free to weigh in on what you've heard here. Yeah, I, I think we probably uh, don't know for now uh, uh, what uh, could be, which could be the unique challenge uh, uh, waiting for us tomorrow. Uh, and when I say tomorrow, uh, I literally means uh, tomorrow because uh, things changing uh, very, very uh, fastly. Uh, anyway, I think that the uh, one of the most important uh, challenge we face is uh, to find uh, a, a balance uh, between the promotion and protection of privacy uh, <coughs> right uh, and the need to uh, guarantee uh, the regular uh, technological innovation. I mean, the, the natural technological uh, um, progress. And I think it's a very, very huge uh, challenge. Uh, yeah, I believe that the most important thing is to remember always that uh, when we speak about the right to privacy or, uh, and uh, uh, about the, the right to innovate, uh, at the end, uh, we speak about uh, two different fundamental rights. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that here we must to avoid to propose any form of antagonism uh, between uh, two fundamental uh, rights. I, it, uh, I, I think uh, it could be incorrect in terms, in legal terms, uh, because uh, uh, in Europe for sure, but probably all over the world, we have tyrannic rights. Uh, then uh, we, we need always balancing between different rights. And I think also uh, it's something that uh, we can avoid because it could be dangerous. Uh, it could be dangerous because uh, uh, we, we, we need to recognize that people uh, like more innovation than privacy. Uh, and uh, uh, they prefer the first to the second. Yeah, uh, we, we have not a regular panel because uh, uh, we are crazy of privacy. We are inside the room uh, in Bermuda. Then I, I, I can test here uh, my, uh, my, my, my thesis, of course. But if you ask to normal people, you prefer innovation or privacy, uh, the answer uh, is, uh, is, is, is obviously. Uh, then uh, I, I think that uh, we, we uh, need to avoid to put privacy privacy against uh, innovation. And uh, we always need to work to guarantee innovation while preserving privacy. That's something uh, also for data protection uh, authorities. Uh, we are uh, the, uh, uh, the, the data protection authority, but we need to preserve uh, the uh, uh, privacy good reputation, uh, I can say, uh, around, uh, around the world. Uh, and I think that's something that we can do. I'm very, very optimistic. Uh, the balancing uh, algorithm um, says that we can compress any right, included privacy uh, right, in the minimum uh, measure necessary to guarantee the exercise of another rights, the rights uh, of innovation, uh, for, for, uh, for instance. Then, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, for instance, the, the, the simple uh, um, risk of a privacy violation, uh, violation can stop the innovation, but at the same time, uh, innovation couldn't be made uh, derogating uh, privacy, uh, privacy, privacy regulation. Also when, and uh, I think it could be the case with artificial intelligence, also when privacy regulation is not completely updated. Uh, but in any case, uh, Duralex said Lex, as, uh, as uh, uh, said uh, my ancient uh, Roman, uh, uh, Roman people, uh, without any exceptions. Uh, then, uh, uh, otherwise, the, the risk is that innovation could become the way to compromise our uh, democratic uh, system, because the technology could become itself a form of uh, uh, regulation, but a form of regulation not coming uh, from democratic institutions, uh, but coming from uh, tech uh, lab, uh, from private sector. And then uh, a regulation adopted 
uh, not in the, in the, in the name of uh, uh, the uh, public uh, human's uh, well-being, but in the name of private interest. And that's uh, a very important, uh, important difference. If something doesn't work in the uh, privacy regulation in force, it's possible, uh, of course. Uh, uh, we, uh, we need to try to modify the rules uh, as soon as possible uh, with a very, very open and multi-stakeholder uh, uh, approach, uh, but respecting a democratic uh, mechanism uh, and uh, not ignoring or try to uh, forcing uh, the, the rules. I know that's uh, very, very uh, difficult, isn't, uh, isn't, isn't easy, but uh, I think that's the challenge uh, we face, and I think that all of us, we know very well that living in democracy isn't easy by definition. No, I, I love that. It makes me think we, we, our guiding principle has to remain privacy in service of of society and innovation in service of society. Uh, Commissioner, uh, let me turn to you. Thank you, thank you. I think I, I, I would echo a lot of what uh, my colleague has said, but uh, I, I think to me the issue in this particular uh, space is, is, is the, the disconnect between the speed at which technology is advancing and developing. You're talking about next year, next year's version, the year after that, these exponential uh, increases. And um, by contrast, the legislative process is quite slow, I think, in most uh, democratic uh, societies. And so you have this disconnect where you have pressure on legislators to catch up legislatively uh, very quickly, which is, is not necessarily usually optimal for the legislative process um, and, and a, real, a real paradox because, because these things are so uh, momentous and important and will have an impact on our society for, for decades to come. Um, you would think you want to spend a lot of time and make sure you're getting it right in terms of that legislative process, but, but at the same time, you have that pressure um, to catch up, which is why I think it's important to identify um, where is the urgency uh, really? Are there laws that apply and how are they applying? And what are the things that really have to happen quickly? Are there things that can happen through a regulation or guidance? Is there flexibility in the system that you can use and build on, um, making sure that we can then adopt those laws and, and have them future-proof and uh, technology uh, neutral but responsive to uh, the challenges that we have. I think the other tension also in terms of um, uh, timing uh, is the, the proactive prevention of privacy harms in the AI space or elsewhere, and, and then the reaction to it through complaints. And so I think that the more we can create incentives, legal and economical and reputational, to doing all of those uh, verifications at the front end before the launch of products, uh, the better. We're calling, uh, this week I will be uh, calling on our, our parliament to put uh, mandatory privacy impact assessments before the fact for, uh, for AI uh, systems because that, uh, that discipline and that review, and I think it was mentioned that a lot of the skills and, and, and the reasoning that has been built up in this community in terms of privacy impact assessment are very useful and very applicable in assessing other types of risk, other types of AI. We talk about algorithmic impact assessment and so on. Well, at the end of the day, it's a lot of the same basic exercise of diligence in identifying the risk, identifying the mitigation section, and putting the value that you're protecting, whether it's privacy, whether it's equality, whether it's fairness, you put that as a top of mind consideration. It's not something that, oh, it's a nice to have thing once we've developed it. No, this is part of the core value. And I agree that it's up to society and up to democracies to say, these, this is what we stand for as a society, including privacy as a fundamental right. And so it needs to be top of mind. We're not, we wouldn't think of building a, a, a super fast plane uh, by neglecting safety, by neglecting pre-departure checks. We wouldn't and say, well, it's so innovative and it's so efficient and it's such a game changer that, you know what, we're prepared to sacrifice that. No, we're not. So this is going to be making it maybe a little bit slower for takeoff, but uh, it's essential and it's part of, of who we are. So um, I think at the same time, you'll have the need for those after the fact complaints. And I do believe that having um, the ability to issue orders or to have fines 
is important because it provides the, the incentives to the top decision makers in organizations. But I would hope to see those uh, as a last recourse and really see those focusing the mind so that we have prevention before the fact instead of um, reaction after the fact. And so um, these are some of the things that I'll be uh, uh, focusing on. And, and um, having, um, again, the other risk is perhaps the overlap, that it's not all privacy, there's other regulators involved. Um, I think we need to work together. I don't think we should be paralyzed by saying, well, until we've appointed this new structure, we can't move forward. That's not true. We have a lot of structures in place. There may be gaps. We should fill those gaps, but in the meantime, we have a lot of tools at our disposal. Uh, we need to use them, we need to use them well, and we, use, we need to use them um, visibly and publicly so that, uh, again, our societies can see uh, that the systems uh, are there. And I, I, I like uh, so much that you point out to the impact assessments. We published research showing that in over 40% of the cases, uh, uh, organizations standing up AI governance programs were leveraging privacy impact assessments to uh, do AI impact assessments. So this room is obviously uh, well suited to, to help your organizations in uh, doing these uh, pre-takeoff checks. Uh, looking at the time, we may only have time for one more question. So Brenda, I'm going to let you uh, kick that off. Uh, on that note, I was going to suggest maybe we, we skip the next yeah. So I'll question and go to the last set of targeted questions, just because our next question was going to be about regulation, and we've kind of talked about that a little bit already. Is everybody okay if we, if we jump to that? Um, so uh, do you want to kick it off then with the... Sure, sure. I'll, uh, I'll kick off. And, and we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, really what um, organizations, what you think organizations can do uh, in terms of the most impactful steps they can take now to implement AI responsibly while we wait for new laws to come online. And so I'm going to turn to each of you uh, to speak to that question. Uh, she, maybe I'll turn to you first on this one. Uh, certainly, uh, OpenAI has been at the forefront. And so what do you see as some of the most impactful steps we can take now? Yeah, sure. So, so I think of it in two different levels, and one is kind of like strategic direction of the company and, and how you're using AI, and another is a little bit more tactical. So if you think about strategically, what, what are you actually using AI technologies for? And, and it's something that you know we internally open, I think, a lot about, which is incentives. And what are the, what is the company's incentive? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to get done, with or without technology, right? And if you're if you're if your business model is a certain thing, then you, you're going to use AI in service of that business model, whatever it is. And so this was something that our founders, the OpenAI founders, kept in mind several years ago when they first started the company. So our company is actually a non, it's run by a nonprofit, and they had a very specific mission, which was not to create the most advanced AI. It wasn't to sell the most AI you know, technology to people. It was to make sure that AI benefits all of humanity. And so the decisions that we make and the, the choices that we make are all geared towards that purpose. And I think hopefully why we have a, I think a, a better and more unique relationship with government agencies where we're saying, hey, in order to do this right, we have to all work together. It's not just industry rushing forward to try to maximize profits. And so, so we do that and we take a number of steps tactically to make sure that we're fulfilling that mission, to make sure that all of humanity benefits, benefits from AI. So, we do, for example, we do a lot of testing of our, of, our, you know, of our models. We publish very detailed reports about the risks and problems. We get attacked a lot for these reports, by the way. And, like, and so because people say, why, why are you doing these things if you are aware of all these potential issues that could come up? And the answer is, you know, we, we think, and you know, in, in discussing with policymakers and, and others, like, we think it, this is still extremely valuable. And it is being borne out by the fact that people are using these tools to increase productivity and connect with people and do all the good things that they're capable of. And so, but, but we also take all these additional steps, right? We do this testing, we publish reports, we've, we've you know, entered into these voluntary commitments with, um, in consultation with the US government and other labs. We're participating in the UK uh, AI Safety Summit in, in a month, and, and just a lot of, di of different steps um, to the point about you know, making sure that it's not just uh, you know, a Silicon Valley company's values reflected in AI systems, we are, you know, we use input from around the world into and training these systems. We also have put out calls for, uh, for pro proposals on how democratic values can be imbued in AI. We've gotten a lot of really interesting proposals there that we're going to start working on and discussing with governments and kind of incorporating into our development processes. And so there's a lot of different steps that 
we're taking and any organization thinking about this needs to take in terms of like where, where are you going with this? What's your end goal? What are the things that you're doing in order to make sure that you know, human values and humanity is at the forefront of technology rather than the other way around? So I'm going to ask a really quick follow-up because uh, you pointed out right at the outset there that incentives matter and structure matters. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering to what extent you feel you've been able to maintain that mission focused as you've partnered with private sector organizations. And I think many of the companies in the room are private sector themselves. And so you know, your lesson in maintaining those values uh, could be useful. Any additional thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a hard, it's about, like everything else we've talked on this panel, it's a, it's a hard balance, right? Because we, we started out as purely a nonprofit many years ago, discovered after a few years that it's actually very hard to raise the funds needed to build useful systems as a nonprofit. And so we had to partner with, you know, investors and, and you know, strategic investors like Microsoft and so on. And so, but we were very, very careful in every time we had this conversation to make, sure, make it clear that what we care about is that mission and not maximizing the amount of money that goes to us or to you. Like we limit the amount of money that our investors can make, we limit the amount of money that our employees can make, and that does help us kind of think through things at a more, uh, I think at a different level than a lot of companies. And so, you know, when, when, if you look at our investment docs, and we posted this online, the very first line of our investment doc for potential investors says, you will, you will probably lose all of your money. You should consider this a donation. Like our mission is to go help make sure AI benefits humanity, not to make the most money. And you have to understand that. That's like the, the first disclaimer that anyone sees. And so, you know, we've been fortunate to find, I think, generally find partners that are aligned with that. There's always, you know, con you know the fric tension and friction and struggles working with different companies. But I think that fundamental incentive alignment is very important for how we operate, and I think helps imbue our, our, you know, our, us with a sense of purpose that's beyond try, trying to sell the most AI to people. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that follow-up, and I think it, it kind of points us all to the need for leadership buy-in uh, from the start and throughout. Um, and let me uh, turn to you. What is the most impactful thing organizations can do now? Well, I will, I will highlight one in, in the interest of time. Uh, so organizations should um, engage affected communities and individuals affected by AI systems. That's the first uh, thing they have to do. Uh, this inclusive approach ensures that AI deployment and, and uh, development is sensitive of the affected societies and individuals. And I'll give you an example. Maybe you, um, some of you are uh, aware of the, uh, the news coming from the United States that the biggest uh, strike against AI by uh, Hollywood actors and writers. Uh, the there are so many issues around that, but the main concern was about AI. It's that the, the writers and, uh, uh, and actors are uh, afraid of being displaced by AI, so job displacement. So they have been negotiating and, and uh, striking for almost five months. And then after five months, they achieved what is sometimes uh, considered uh, the, 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 the biggest achievement or victory against AI. They, they agreed, they unanimously approved the agreement uh, signed by their uh, union leaders. And what that contract says is that AI cannot be used to write or rewrite script, or any AI generated content cannot be considered a source material. So they, now we have the biggest uh, collective, <laughs> collective agreement in the world about AI. And this kind of protest is not an isolated incident. It's, it resonates with uh, resistance around the world about AI, especially in the platform economy that platform workers have no legal, institutional, and technological support, and they realize that the existing systems do not support them, and they, they started to find out new and unique ways to push back against algorithmic control, discrimination, everything. And they are creating solidarity around the world. It's not in one country, in many, many countries. So the, the, the first thing organizations should do is they have to listen to this kind of growing frustration. They have to listen and, and, and consider the lived experiences, the concerns and fears of the communities that are actually impacted by the AI system. Thank you so much. Reach out and listen. Get multi-stakeholder views. That, that is good advice for all of us. Brenda, the last question. 
Okay, so we're going to uh, turn back to the commissioners here for our last, uh, last question and wrap up. We've spent a lot of time, and we all spend a lot of time, talking about the challenges and the harms and the concerns around AI, and of course, rightfully so. Um, but as we head into this last uh, question, um, I'd like to offer that we should focus for a minute on how to also maximize the benefits that we see from AI. Uh, it is certainly a regulator's job to protect or impose penalties for the harms that have been identified, um, but it's also part of the role to ensure that people receive full value and benefits from the systems that are available and the opportunities that those provide. Uh, we do know that AI can be used to identify existing bias in human systems, which got us to this point today. And the fact that we have all that bias data is because the human systems were biased and that AI can actually help us identify and equalize for that in some cases. It can certainly improve accessibility for diverse communities, for people with physical or mental uh, conditions that benefit from greater access or options for accommodations. Um, and it can certainly provide very detailed analysis of complex topics beyond anything that we've been able to do in the past, whether those are environmental issues um, or other related sorts of, of things. Um, given all that, I would like to ask the commissioners now, uh, uh, Commissioner Dufresne, I'll start with you. Um, what do you see are the biggest opportunities offered by AI and how can regulatory schemes contribute to maximizing those benefits? Thank you. Well, I will, um I'll go back to the source I used at the beginning to identify risks and, and the OECD report in September when it was highlighting privacy and copyright and disinformation also identified the benefits and the top gains. Um, and those were productivity gains. We've talked about that, the 40% statistic I had also heard. And I, I find that interesting because you, you highlight that uh, that could be a gain, it could be a challenge too in terms of, of jobs and so on. But I, I think that it can also potentially be, and I'm thinking about my, the legal profession where I'm from, is the, the, the risk perhaps to, to volumes and, and amount of work, but that can be also translated into the type of work that you end up doing, maybe more leadership work, judgment work, values work, and, and so maybe we're going to be developing a next generation of not just lawyers but leaders around the world where you're going to be focusing and training those reflexes of perhaps management, leadership, values, ethics, and so on with uh, using that productivity gain uh, from AI. Uh, the second was promoting innovation entrepreneurship. The third was improving healthcare. The fourth was uh, helping solve the climate crisis. So obviously, uh, key societal gains that we absolutely need to be working on, and uh, the more help we can have, the better. So those are, those are absolutely uh, important uh, and, and, and uh, good uses that should be encouraged. Uh, what can we do um, as, uh, as regulators? I think that we can, you know, when I, when I talk about privacy, and I, I always talk about privacy as, as being about privacy as a fundamental right, privacy as supporting the public interest, and privacy as accelerating trust for citizens. And I think as DPAs, we can bring those three value propositions to, uh, to organizations working with us to show that, look, if you do a PIA, if you're consulting with us, if you're seen to be consulting with us, if you're participating in our sandbox or you're following our guidance or you're part of certification programs, well, you, you, you have somehow demonstrated that you're trying to reach this fundamental right protection, that the public interest and privacy are not obstacles, that they can, they can and must coexist, and that, gen that generates trust. So I think that um, working with, uh, with industry, trying to help put these incentives, you talked about incentives earlier, and I'm a, I'm a huge believer of incentives. I try to look at privacy issues, not just from my standpoint as the regulator, the privacy commissioner, but also as the chief executive officer of my organization as an employer, as a decision maker who has to comply. So how do you incentivize decisions at the most senior levels? Well, you do that by rewarding the, the good behavior and by not rewarding the bad behavior. So as DPAs, I think we should be um, highlighting good practices, um, giving awards, recognition, finding ways not just to be calling out uh, through complaints or orders uh, the bad behavior, but uh, the good behavior so that we can uh, encourage that and, and, and generate trust. And when we're making decisions, sometimes finding uh, breaches and, and flaws, that we do it uh, in a constructive way that highlights what went wrong, uh, what could be done in the future, what are the expectations. Um, one of the inputs that was received by the OECD, by industry and by uh, lawyers and by uh, privacy professionals was that um, 
it was a hard sell sometimes to their boards and to the CEOs to, in terms of investing lots of resources in privacy programs or certification programs if you couldn't show the returns on, on that investment at the end. So one of the, one of the tools, and that is proposed in that Bill C-27 in Canada, is certification programs which would have a legal effect at the end of the day. So if you're part of that and you respect that, well, that influences how the regulator is going to treat a complaint that it may get against you down the line. Maybe the complaint's going to be dismissed, or maybe there will be no fines uh, because you have shown that due diligence. So I think working, working together with those incentives, of, of course, we have a role to play to protect and promote, and sometimes that role includes uh, dealing with complaints, and that becomes a, a more formal process. But um, working together to, to generate that trust and to, uh, to highlight the coexistence of privacy Obviously, human rights and equality with innovation and a strong economy uh, is key, and that's certainly something that, uh, that I'll continue to do. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that perspective on the, the challenges and the identified impacts can be both from the what is it costing us, but also from the what is it gaining us, and figuring out ways to sort of get the benefit of one and hopefully uh, uh, mitigate or ameliorate the problems from the other. So, um, And I, I think there's probably no one who doesn't uh, wouldn't be thrilled to find ways to regulate in, in with the impact that generates trust, uh, valid and credible trust in, in these systems. So um, if, if we can do that, I think we would, we would all be winners in that regard. So uh, Commissioner Scorza, I will turn to you for the final word on that. What, is, what are the opportunities you see that are offered by AI and the regulatory schemes that you think would contribute to maximizing them? Let me share a very important information with our audience, uh, the countdown. Uh, you, you, have, you have a couple minutes. minutes, it's okay. Then, you, you've got what you we need. We are finishing, but that's, uh, that's, for, that's for sure. We want uh, to hear your thoughts. I, 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 I think uh, we, we first need to define what means uh, benefits, uh, what means that uh, a, a new technology, artificial intelligence, uh, today produces uh, benefits for, uh, for society. And uh, in my view, uh, we can say that a new technology produces uh, benefit for uh, society Society, if uh, it increase the human uh, well-being. And uh, um, we, we can't uh, increase the human uh, well-being not respecting uh, human rights, not respecting uh, privacy. Then uh, I think that the best that we as Data Protection Authority we can do uh, to maximize the uh, artificial intelligence benefits for uh, society is uh, simply to to do our duty. Uh, promoting and uh, protecting uh, privacy rights, uh, assuring that uh, the market, the uh, industry uh, in the field of artificial uh, uh, intelligence uh, avoid uh, any kind of uh, sacrifice of dignity, any kind of sacrifice of humanity, any kind of sacrifice of fundamental rights in the name uh, of uh, business and, and, and money. Uh, nothing more and nothing uh, less. Thank you so much. I think that is actually the best possible wrap-up we could have had, given that, that Caitlin started by quoting uh, Commissioner Slaughter from this morning, saying how at the heart of it all is people, and we need to remember that as our focus as, as, pri as professionals, privacy, AI, uh, regulators and lawyers and practitioners, um, and then to, to wrap up with that very uh, sincere reminder that, that at the end of the day, it's about making society better, it's about making people's lives better, and it's not about the machines, but about the machines and what they can do um, for us and to make that all better. So I would like to thank uh, all of our participants today. This thank has you. been a great discussion. I hope that you have all enjoyed it.